Okay, so we begin now. So let me first welcome our honoree, Karen Ullenberg. So Karen, don't run away. <laughs> okay, so let's put that here. We need that later. So uh, first of all, I would like to welcome Gyatja Harvik, I hope I uh, pronounced that correctly, is Counselor for Science, Technology, and Higher Education uh, from the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Washington, D.C. I uh, want to welcome Marius Gerda, Deputy Chief of Mission from Washington, D.C. Uh, then uh, Dan Knopf, Associate Dean for Graduate Education in the College of Natural Sciences from the University of Texas. Then invisible at this point, but he presumably hears me, is Dan Fried, and he will sort of Skype in at some point. Uh, David Gabay, uh, Chair of the Princeton Mathematics Department, and Alice Cheng and Ed Witten, who both will say something about Karen's uh, work at the end. So, of course, I also welcome you all uh, to joining us in celebration of Karen Ullenbeck, who just was awarded the Arbel Prize. Before, before we really start, let me also thank Liz Wood and the IS staff for organizing this in absolute secrecy, which seems to be usually quite difficult. <laughs> so uh, Karen has a, a long affiliation with the Institute. She has been here at different stages of her career as a member, as well as a visiting professor, I think actually twice. She is a co-founder of what is now called the IIS Park City Mathematics Institute and a founder of the Women in Mathematics program. So Karen is not only uh, one of the leading mathematicians of our times, but she always has been a very good citizen, caring about the profession, in particular about the people involved in, uh, the people involved in it. And that is why for me and I think for everybody else, she is a big role model. When Karen retired from UT Austin, uh, we at the IIS and Princeton University were thrilled that she made Princeton her new home. So on behalf of the School of Mathematics and the Institute for Advanced Study, I propose a toast. Okay, so Karen. <laughs> and, uh, well, you just... <laughs> <laughs> to Karen, a great mathematician and a wonderful human being. Here, here. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so Karen, you have to deal with more speeches, so <laughs> and at the end you can say something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so David Gabay will say some words. Well, to start with, congratulations, Karen, winning the 2019 Abel Prize. Thank you all for, for coming to this, this reception that is being co-sponsored by the Princeton University Mathematics Department. And, 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 and thank you, the staff of, of, of Institute for Advanced Study for, for, for arranging this, this so magnificent re reception. So, in case you don't know, uh, since 2016, Karen's been a visiting senior research scholar at, at Princeton University and, and has been an, an active presence sort of in, in the department uh, you know, mathematical activities. I should say that I'm aware of only one other senior research scholar in, in the math department, and that was, that was John Nash. Who, who won the 2015 Abel Prize. So, uh, so in a few moments, I guess Alice Chang and Ed Witten will say a few works about Karen's deep and foundational work, but I, I'd like to just say a couple of things that, uh, that sort of you know, touched me personally as a, as a low-dimensional topologist. And, and that is uh, uh, Alice, uh, Karen's sort of uh, you know, great work with Jonathan Sachs on, on uh, minimal surfaces in, in, in three-dimensional manifolds, in particular hyperbolic three-manifolds. And, 
and uh, her, th her theorem with, with, with uh, John Jonathan Sachs sort of in the independently proved by Shane and Yao that, that if you have a map of, of say, a closed surface into uh, hyperbolic three manifold, money in three manifold, then, and it has the property that, that sort of injects on at the fundamental group level on simple loops, then, then it's homotopic to a, a min minimal immersion. And that's really a, a foundational theorem in, in three-dimensional topology. And, and there's sort of this one other theorem which, which as far as I'm aware is sort of in an unpublished preprint of, of Karen's, but I think it's, a it's just really magnificent and elegant result. And that is that if you have a hyperbolic three manifold and, and a, a su surface of, say, closed surface of genus G, and that surface is, is a stable minimal surface, then then its area is lies between sort of two pi g minus one and four pi g minus one. So the the, uh, the fact that it's less than four pi g minus one that's sort of Gauss Binet theorem. But the fact that it's at least two pi times g minus one, that's Karen's theorem. And and this sort of really beautiful theorem sort of is sort of sort of uh, sort of foreshadowed sort of you know deep works of of Rick Shane and uh, on coding and Minicozzi on, uh, on on stable minimal surfaces. So, anyway, con congratulations, Karen, and it's it's just just really wonderful that that you've been recognized with the Abel Prize. So, Dan. Dan yeah. So next will be Dan Dan Knopf from. So it's a real honor for me to be here representing the University of Texas at Austin, the College of Natural Sciences, and, and, and the math department. Uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, we have a saying, what starts here changes the world. And although Karen did not start at the University of Texas, we count ourselves very fortunate uh, that she made it her mathematical home starting in 1987 and remaining with us for almost three decades. Um, Interjecting a brief personal note, I first met Karen at a con Journal of Differential Geometry conference at Harvard where, interestingly enough, she and Ed Witten both spoke, just like today. Um, and, you know, at, uh, she spoke with me at a dinner, um, completely unassuming, completely approachable, and you know, this is one of my mathematical heroes, right? It's the late 90s, I'm an aspiring geometric analyst, I'm just some graduate student from, from somewhere. Um, and of course I knew her mathematics was foundational, um, but it was really a delight to see what an extraordinary human being she is. Um, and I want to speak about that in one way. We have experts who are gonna talk about her mathematical brilliance, um, the category that NSF calls um, intellectual merit. I want to say something uh, about her broader impact. Um, in addition to her mathematics, she was an extraordinary leader in building up the math department at UT Austin. Not just the geometry group, yes, but the, the department more broadly and reaching out across group boundaries. Um, I still hold her up as an example of perhaps the best mentor that I've ever met. Um, I came to UT in 2004 as an assistant professor and it was a little bit humbling to realize I had a, an office down the hall from one of my heroes. Um, but for everyone from assistant professors, postdocs, and graduate students, Karen has been a fantastic uh, mentor and role model. And this spring, um, we're rolling out a new uh, initiative in the college. We are putting posters all over campus celebrating uh, extraordinary achievements, um, sometimes by people at UT, sometimes by people around the world, the people who are at the head of their field. Um, and Karen is at the very top of this list of people that we're celebrating. Um, and I have with me today the very first poster that has been printed. Um, and I would like to share it with you. Well, that picture is very old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, um, and we've 
Katie does, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is going to be going up uh, all over the college very soon. <laughs> and the idea uh, behind, and it's we're also going to be going on a, a website uh, that CNS will uh, go live with next week. Um, and the idea, our hope, is that young adults and even school children throughout Texas can s possibly see themselves as scientists, as mathematicians, can see faces that represent the diversity that we have as a people and can perhaps be inspired that they too can aspire to math and science careers. And so it's very exciting for me uh, that someone who's been a personal inspiration to me as a mathematician and as a mentor will get an opportunity to uh, perhaps serve as an inspiration to a much broader community. So congratulations from UT Austin. We are, we are thrilled um, to see you receive this much deserved honor. <laughs> Okay, so now, if technology works, we should see Ben Fried at some point. Hi, Karen. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I know you're not in Austin. <laughs> I'm not in Austin, but I'm not in Princeton either, unfortunately. But I'm glad I could join you virtually. So, uh, like Dan, I too met Karen when I was a graduate student. It was just several years before Dan, I'm afraid, in 1982. And um, shortly after that, we started working on the first of many, uh, many joint projects. So I've had the chance to admire Karen from up close for so many years, I thought I'd just share a few observations. So first, just some general words about Karen as a mathematician. I think of Karen as a, as a real maverick. She's someone that can go into a new area, something quite unexplored, and somehow hone in on the, just the core issue. And in that uh, unexplored territory, she, she proves these amazing fundamental theorems with you know, incredible technical expertise. And those theorems then open up new pathways, and her beautiful mathematics is the guiding light that others follow down these pathways and discover these riches of more and more beautiful mathematics, which just speaks to the depth um, of uh, her insights into opening those up. So as a variation on what we say in Texas, as Dan said, what, what, Karen, what starts with Karen changes the mathematical world. So Karen moved to Texas, um, and honestly, I'm not sure in a sense why. It might be some kind of inner Texan that's in Karen. It might be the outer Texan that I don't see in the picture. But I'd also like to see that uh, I think that in some measure, it's that same spirit of exploration and adventure that led Karen to go to an Austin, which you know, in those days was very, very different than the Austin now. And it's very different from Princeton either then or now, I've got to say. And, um, you know, when Karen was there, she started exploring not just new mathematics, but also new um, ways in the community to inspire and train and mentor young mathematicians. And of course, at the IAS, you know that very well. And it's because of Karen's great vision that she saw that the Park City Institute, which uh, was a few years old, really was a great marriage with the Institute in Princeton, and that that was a way for both to thrive. And of course, the mentoring program for women, and on, 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 on. So, um, so Karen, I got to tell you, I don't really know why you left Austin to go back to New Jersey, back to your roots, but I will tell you that um, I really miss having you next door, close at hand, and especially, and I know you do miss those long, late rambling, late afternoon, very rambling chats <laughs> that would go well into the evening about mathematics, about everything, about life. And I have to tell you, when I called you a few days ago to congratulate you, I got very nostalgic because in about 10 seconds flat, you changed the topic to the Anacheck Stream Quartet you had just heard. <laughs> so that reminded me, of course, of all of our chats. So, it's really a joy, a continuing joy, to call you my teacher, mentor, collaborator, colleague, and of course, above all, friend. And now it's just a wonderful delight that we can all call you um, Abel Prize winner. That's so deserved and, and so wonderful and a fitting honor. So I think everyone has a glass. So here's to many more years of health and new adventures in mathematics and beyond. The next speaker is uh, Marius Liodin. So we now st start with a really serious part. Huh? <laughs> Because I'm in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Ullenbeck. Uh, my name is Marius Jordal. I'm representing the Norwegian Embassy uh, in Washington. Uh, the ambassador himself uh, was not able to come today, so uh, as his deputy, I, I got that honor. Um, and it's really a great honor and a privilege for me on behalf of our embassy in, in Washington to congratulate you, Professor, on being named the winner of the 2019 Abel Prize. The uh, Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters and the Norwegian government are very much looking forward to hosting you for the uh, award ceremony in, in Oslo in May. 
during the Abel week. The Abel week is, uh, in fact, uh, about spreading the love of mathematics, uh, both through communicating with the general public and especially by inspiring younger generations and children. One of the highlights uh, will be your public lecture at the University of Oslo, and another is a visit to the University of Bergen, which also includes a mathematical game with children in uh, Archimedes' lab labyrinth uh, in the University Garden. So we are looking very much forward to, to that. The prize itself will be awarded by His Majesty, the King of Norway, Harald V. And uh, in addition, the Norwegian government will uh, host a banquet in your honor. So again, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to congratulate you on your well-deserved Abel Award. And I would like to propose a toast the way we do it in, in Norway. Uh, we say skål. Uh, congratulations. So it is a great, great honor for me uh, to be here as a member of the Abel Prize Selection Committee and to report here some work of uh, Karen Wollenberg, which our prize was based. I will here just briefly summarize the citations. So uh, first, start with a short citation. The short citation is, the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters has decided to award the Abel Prize 2019 to Karen Wollenberg for her pioneering achievements in geometric partial differential equation, gauge theory, and the integrable systems and for the fundamental impact of her work on analysis, geometry, and the mathematical physics. Okay. So uh, here is a three-page long citation, but uh, here I will just uh, briefly summarize some of it. So we all know Karen Wollenberg is a founder of modern, modern geometric analysis. Uh, which we all know is a field which we use techniques in analysis and differential equation to study problems in geometry, analysis, and physics. And one of the basic tools is the method of calculus operations, and which we employ to study critical point of functionals. For example, Minimum surfaces are critical point of area. And uh, uh, harmonic map are the critical point of the Dirichlet energy. So Karen's contribution in this field have three main directions. And the first direction, the first early work is the bubbling analysis and minimum surfaces. The second area is the study of young mills equation gauge theory. The third direction is integrable system. So here I will first describe the first area of work bubbling analysis, and the minimum surface. In the 1970s, an important tool in global analysis to study when is a minimum sequence of a functional achieve its minimum 
is called palais smell condition. If palais smell condition is satisfied, then one knows the minimum is achieved. But one also knows that palais smell condition sometimes fails. The method is very effective when the domain is one dimensional. For example, when one study close geodesics, okay, one very length of a curve and so on. But in two dimensional domain, one knows sometimes it fails. And in, uh, in two fundamental paper in 1981-82, Ullenbeck uh, together with co-author Sachs, Jenison Sachs, described for harmonic map energy functional for two-dimensional manifold to the target manifold when it fails. It fails depending on the topology of the target manifold. And when the second fundamental group of the target manifold is non-vanishing, then sometimes it fails. But what they did is they further describe when the condition failed, what happened. They constructed a minimum sequence of the energy functional which converges and which converges everywhere except finite number of points. And then they went further to describe exactly at those finite many points what happened. And that's what we call bubbling analysis. And they describe at that point, the thing is like you put the sphere into the manifold and by rescaling argument, they describe the bubble. Okay. And this is called bubbling analysis. And uh, this work have a fundamental influence in the later many, many different functional uh, related to nonlinear partial differential equation and systems. Yeah. And so this is in two dimension. And the method also creates a lot of minimal surfaces, existence of minimal surfaces. In higher dimension, Ullenberg and Rick Shen generalize the study of harmonic map to high dimension when the domain is of dimension bigger than or equal to three. And they, they show that the minimal map has singularity of dimension n minus three. That is surprising because one would guess n minus two. Okay. They describe n minus three singularity and where the bubbling phenomena at the singularity now is replaced by the tangent cone behavior. Okay. So this, the methods in these uh, two, these revolutional work are now standard toolbox in all branches of geometric analysis. And we can see the same bubbling phenomena apply to many, many different problems. For example, in the study of Yamabe equations and in the work of Gromov in the study of pseudo-holomorphic curves and also in the study of instantons in uh, problems in mass physics. I think Professor Wheaton will remark more in this direction. So, and now let me very briefly describe her work in the second direction, second important view, that's gauge theory and the young mills equation. After hearing a talk by Atiya at Chicago in the late 70s, Ullenberg became interested in gauge theory and the study of young mills equation. Gauge theory is the, uh, involve both a manifold and a bundle. So think about bundle as a space-time. So space-time, a model is space-time. So on this bundle, there is a connection coordinate change, okay? And then the group 
on a bundle creates invariance, and that's called gauge invariance. And Young Mills equation is study of the curvature functional or the energy functional with respect to these connections. And the important breakthrough of Ullenbeck in this field is she pointed out she used the column gauge. She said that since this functional is gauge invariant, you choose a special gauge, and that's a gauge already appear in physics that's called column gauge. And with respect to this column gauge, Young Mills equation become an elliptic system. So one can apply the tool we already know in analysis to study the solution of Young Mills equation. So from there, she had the two famous results. One is the compactness result, depending on the curvature in LP, compactness of Young Mills solution, and the other is the celebrated result <laughs> called the removable singularity result. She proves that on four-dimensional Young Mills equation, if it's smooth everywhere on a puncture ball, then it's smooth across the point, the singularity. So any solution of Young Mills equation from R4, Euclidean four space, already come from four sphere. So, and her ideas and the methods lay the analytic foundation for the later application of gauge theory opened the field for the mathematician to study a subject of great interest in physics. I will leave it to, to Professor Wheaton to describe the physics background and the influence of her work in this direction. Okay, so uh, uh, let me also say, I haven't finished, okay, say uh, the, <laughs> the third topic is integrable system, okay. The study of integrable system has its roots in the 19th century classical mechanics. And Ullenberg, what she did is the, the relation, relate the concept of integrable system to harmonic map. So this happens when the target man manifold of the harmonic map has lots of symmetry. It's a symmetric space. And in her famous paper in 1989, she algebraically, numerically, created a system of solution for harmonic map when the target manifold has symmetry, so certain symmetric property. And this is an important paper and which led to a series of other paper in this research field. And later also jointly with Chu Lian Chen, they further studied the integrable system and apply it to conservation law and uh, other, uh, in many other settings. And this create an active and still a fruitful research field. And the impact of Karen's work is really not limited to geometric analysis. Before all this important work in geometric analysis, in 1977, she also has a paper in 1977 in Octa Mass, which is in, she study the regularity of a system of uh, elliptic equations. And this system is the higher energy functional, something like an Laplace operator, but in a system setting and with, with application to problem in gauge theory. And this paper extend early work of the George Nash Moser's work from uh, single nonlinear PDE to system of the linear PDE. This paper is widely cited and the method has been applied and influenced the development of the whole field. Okay. So the conclusion of our citation is 
Karen Ullenberg's pioneer results had a fundamental impact on contemporary analysis, geometry, mathematical physics. Her ideas and leadership has transformed the math landscape as a whole. Okay. Sure. And on a personal note, I'd like to add some remark. I have long admired the work of Karen Wollenberg and think of her as my role model in my career. And as you have heard from other speakers, Karen's achievement is not limited to research. She is a well-known, generous role model, and she has done a lot of mentoring work in the mathematical community. I'm very sure, especially she is a mentor of many women mathematicians. I'm very sure many of them are as thrilled as I am about her being recognized and for this great honor of Abel Prize. Congratulations. So uh, it's, a, it's a delight for all of us to have Karen recognized in this way. And it's an honor for me to be invited to speak a little bit about her influence in physics. Uh, you've heard already uh, quite a bit about her influence in math. So in doing so, uh, I'll talk especially about her work in gauge theory. So gauge theory, and especially non-abelian gauge theory, is the framework in which, in the 1970s, physicists learned to understand the elementary particles in the form of the standard model of particle physics. But when Karen became involved in the late 70s, non-abelian gauge theory was a scarcely known subject mathematically. And she was one of the most important pioneers in developing it as a mathematical subject. And her results here had important influence for both physics and math. So <clears throat> among her foundational results, some of which you've just heard about from Alice, as well as from others previously, one of the important results was her removable singularities theorem for what are called gauge theory instantons in four space-time dimensions. So mathematically, this result explained, roughly speaking, what was the difficulty in understanding instanton moduli space. And so her result gave the um, uh, street signs that were followed by Donaldson and others later when they learned to develop new directions in four-manifold theory based on the foundations of non-abelian gauge theory. For physicists, what the theorem meant was roughly that the small instanton singularity was the only ultraviolet singularity in instanton moduli space, which showed its special role. And later, there were many adventures in physics in trying to understand it. And many of the most interesting and surprising developments in string theory later on came by understanding the role of uh, the small instanton singularity. It would be fun to lecture about that and all the fun things that happened there, but I think I'm going to resist the temptation to go into too much detail in that direction right now. <clears throat> so uh, the other result that of Karen's, which has been most important for me at least, has certainly been her work with Yale um, uh, explaining the correspondence between uh, Hermish and Yang Mills solutions and holomorphic vector bundles of a certain type. So roughly, there are some equations you'd like to solve, or at least you'd like to be able to predict when they have solutions, and learn as much as you can about the solutions. And there's something else you can do, which is much easier to do, but it doesn't involve solving the equation. And so the theorem says that if you can do x, which is relatively understandable, it predicts the existence of a solution to your nonlinear equation. And it has all kinds of repercussions mathematically, but uh, as a physicist, what I'm most interested in is that it's the starting point in understanding a certain class of sigma models, we call them, which are very important in string theory. And I could go on a little bit and tell you also about uh, Karen's bubbling in uh, sigma models, 
but uh, I think I've given you a little bit en enough of a taste. So uh, 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 it's been a pleasure to have the chance to tell you a little bit about how the fact that Karen's important results in math, some of which in part were inspired by physics, have in turn have a lot of influence in physics. Thank you. Thank you very much. In all the fuss and feathers, I forgot to prepare something. But I've given, I think this, I've given about six interviews in the last two days, so I can pull up from some of those interviews some of the things that I said. <clears throat> Thank you very much for uh, all this uh, uh, praise and uh, description of my work and so forth. <clears throat> I have to say, from the perspective of uh, in the uh, late 70s, uh, I find myself as a young mathematician sort of impressive too. So, <laughs> in, fact, in fact, I have forgotten all the things that I worked on. And uh, <clears throat> coming to the Institute and listening to talks, every once in a while somebody mentions a result of mine and I say, oh yes, I was interested in that then. And uh, I, I fear if I have any, any one failing, it's getting really involved and interested in something and then kind of wandering away and finding something else to be interested in. But um, <clears throat> uh, the special year this year has been particularly uh, wonderful for me because I recognize some of the ideas that I was in on the, in the beginning of um, and, and I thought were really, at the time, really very interesting, and uh, I don't think anybody paid much attention to them. I mean, one typical thing was is the fact that I realized that you could parameterize uh, Kleinian groups by minimal surfaces in their second fundamental form. And I, was, I thought it was a fascinating result, and I thought no one paid attention to it, but it turns out people do pay attention to it, and I was cited in a talk, and so uh, it's very rewarding. <laughs> I also have to tell a story on myself that uh, I also was sitting in a lecture and somebody credited me with a theorem. And I said, I didn't prove that theorem, but I didn't say anything. And a, a couple weeks later, someone passed me the preprint. I had never published it, a preprint that actually was my proof of that theorem. So this is what happens when you become an old mathematician. <laughs> but uh, but um, the institute was actually very important in my career. The year I spent in 1979, 1980, which uh, was a year organized by ST Yao, was just eye-opening for me. and. Um, it really brought me into the math community and made me feel like a member of the math community. And so the Institute has been very special for me. Um, I think many of the people who uh, are uh, uh, interested in are, are congratulating me on the ABO Prize are um, uh, doing so because uh, I'm a woman and I'm the first woman to uh, to, to get it, and uh, I, always, I always tell the story, I, I can't help resist it, that actually it isn't quite as unnerving. I was actually the second woman to give a plenary address at the International Congress of Mathematicians, but this was in 1990. The first woman was Emmy Noethe in 1932, <laughs> which is a pretty frightening fact when you're in the middle of it. Now it doesn't seem so bad, but uh, anyway, uh, it's, it's, it's not so easy being a role model. One of the things you learned uh, when, you're, uh, when you're going through life and so forth is, is that you need role models, but you don't need perfect role models. You need role, role models who fall down and pick themselves up. Uh, um, you need role models who show how even though you can't do everything, you can do some things. Uh, you need role models to keep you going. And actually, one of the things that people, uh, uh, the, the people, interviewers have asked me is, is that I have a role model. And I thought, I, I've thought about it before and I thought about it at the time, and I can tell you who my role model was. It was Julia Child. She had these fantastic television programs, and she, boy, was she a real person. And she could pick the turkey up off the floor and serve it. <laughs> So anyway, but um, people ask me, have things changed for women? 
And I want to say, boy, have they. And that's because you're all, most of you are young. You don't know what it was like. I mean, in the, it wasn't until the 60s and 70s that the laws that uh, prevented women from getting, and, and women and minorities, mind you, from getting jobs were taken off the books. So I was really at the first stage that uh, it was really possible that you could, unless you were specially protected or had you know, relatives that would help you and so forth, that you could get, make your way into mathematics and become a mathematician. Of course, it wasn't, there were, there were still some laws, but um, um, some universities hired women without worrying about it too much, and it was a, it was a great moment. Uh, and I do have to say that along with a lot of the other women who took advantage of this, uh, what we thought was now the laws are changed and the uh, doors are no longer locked, that women would just march through and take their right, women and blacks, by the way, women and minorities, would march through the doors and take their rightful place in academia. And uh, sad to say, it was not that simple. And uh, so, but it is a lot better now. And I hope that I have helped to make it a better place. So uh, I also want to say one last thing, and that's thanks to the Norwegian government for recognizing pure mathematics. It's a wonderful subject, a lot of fun, and I feel very privileged not only to have been a research mathematician, but to have enjoyed it and to be rewarded for it. Thank you very much.